welcome to Modern Anarchy, the podcast featuring real conversations with conscious objectors to the status quo. I'm your host, Nicole. On today's episode, we have Mistress Sybil Fury join us for a conversation about harnessing the power of dominance. Together, we talk about early kink memories in Catholicism, the risks of having only one erotic mirror, and Mistress Sybil Fury's fascist state. Y'all, it is episodes like this that make me so joyful for the life that I am living because this is a dream. Being able to talk about liberating pleasure, liberating play, exploring parts of ourselves that have been repressed. Ooh, it is just so incredibly juicy that I am just delighted at my future career in this space and happy to be sharing it with all of you dear listeners who are tuning in each week. I also want to say happy pride, y'all, to all my queers out there. This is our month. This is our time to continue to riot and fight for the world that we believe in and also celebrate the beauty of our magic. And this title, oh my goodness, how many people have clicked on this episode because it pissed them off from the title, hi, I see you. I am here and I'm going to explain myself. (laughs) Yeah, the ethical argument against monogamy. Okay, how did we get here? I mean, you're gonna see in the episode how we got here, but I think there's a little bit to say about that before we get there. Mistress Sybil told her story of becoming a dominatrix while in a monogamous relationship, one that she continued to have while doing her dominatrix work. And she gets into talking about how she felt different parts of herself come up in this work, in these relationships with various people, and goes in to talk about the benefits of having more than one erotic mirror. And she felt this while in a monogamous relationship, even though she doesn't practice it now. It was one where she talks about being able to feel that change in her and notice the benefit uniquely of having erotic containers and how it is actually very different than the types of relationships we can have with friends and our family. It quite literally brings out parts of you, your psyche, your identity, the space to play with them because of this unique container. Let's take some time to slow down and process what we mean by the word monogamy, right? Because to some people, monogamy means you can't hold hands with anybody else. For some people, it means you can't give a kiss on the cheek to anybody else or snuggle or flirt or even like an Instagram picture of another person. I've heard that one. Um, And... Maybe monogamy to you means that you can kiss other people, but only kiss. Maybe it means that you can have kink play with other people, but kink play that doesn't include penetration. And or maybe your monogamy is fluid bonding, right? And there are also people who practice open monogamy, right? That might mean something like swinging, which would still fall under the category of monogamy for some people. And even the practice of monogamish would still, right, fall under that category of monogamy because those people identify as having a monogamous partner where they practice sexual freedom with other people, right? So I think at the end of the day, this really isn't a argument against monogamy. It is a argument against sexual and erotic fidelity where the only place that you are practicing and or playing with your sexuality is with one person. We need to have more erotic mirrors, right? Maybe that's flirting with another person or watching porn, right? And seeing yourself reflected in porn as you intake that media. The reality is we need other relationships to show us parts of ourselves, right? Whether that's even reading 
erotic content, you have to remember that when you are reading erotic content, what you're really reading is an author's narrative. They are telling you a story. They are painting you a picture and you become in relationship with that person. And that story shapes your sense of self and how you play erotically. And what we're talking about here then is having spaces for multiple erotic mirrors, whether that means in person where you do flirtation, whether that means where you do kink play that doesn't include penetration, right? Like there's just such a range here of various ways that you can tap into different erotic mirrors, but trying to figure out all of your eroticism, your sense of self that is connected to that with one person, with one thing, I would say is pretty tricky. And, you know, I can only talk about my own lived experience here and say that since recording this episode a few months back, I found a relationship where I could play with my dominant side. And you know what? It was lovely. It was so lovely to command that space and to tell that man how lucky he was to be with me and to own that and to step into that has changed how I've played in other spaces because like Sybil talks about, there was a shattering. There was these parts of myself that I had never even tapped into. And we'll unpack all of that in this episode and probably for the rest of my lifetime exploring these things, right? But I tapped into it and it felt so juicy that I will continue to explore everything in that space and invite other people who feel that calling and desire to play with their dominant side that you know, it might feel new and it might feel uncomfortable, but if you feel that calling to go there, there is something there to explore. There is something there to play with. And I will say too that one of the most joyous pieces about this experience for me of embarking on a new play dynamic with someone who trusted me to be able to explore my dominant top sides is that I was able to come to one of my partners that I have built such a loving and beautiful relationship with that we engage in sexual dynamic and play together more of a dom sub dynamic where I play into a sub role and (laughs) y'all and it was so good to be able to come to him and talk to him about my experiences, to talk to him about where my head went during that first time trying to navigate a dom space because it's also one that he knows. And being able to share the intimacy of my play with other people and for it to not be this thing that tore apart our relationship or brought up lots of jealousy and something that we could actually talk about together and the different parts of myself that I was exploring in these other relationships, that makes me want to cry. Tears of beauty and love that there can be intimacy and shared connection about the parts that we can explore of ourselves in this lifetime, whether it be with that partner or not. And being able to have that romance together to talk about that. Oh, you know, we talk about always this idea of romance being, you know, a shared partnership, someone who's there with you, someone to walk with you and be with you. And wow, my sexuality has always been something that was explored either by myself or with a partner. And to be able to have partnership and process the other parts of myself coming up in different partnerships, it's just a level of intimacy I have yet to experience. The one that's filled with freedom and a sense of independence created through multiple relationships and the connection and I'm just yeah I am so happy to have these relationships in my life and to be exploring these things and it's so beautiful to have partnership in that space a space where y'all every single sex experience I am having and kink experience is teaching me and unlocking parts of myself that I didn't know existed Okay, that was not the kind of sex that I was having before when I was doing PV Vanilla Living by the Scripts. Like, I am unpacking parts of myself and my identity 
during every experience. And I am just so, so thankful to have other people who see and can understand that and join me in that space of exploration together. I just, I find it so incredibly beautiful. And that is a lot of what Mistress Sybil and I talk about today. And I'm so thankful to have them on the podcast and to talk about these things. And for someone who gets it, I continue to revel in the magic of having people who see the world that you do and the levels of intimacy that you're able to explore in conversation together. And I hope that you can feel that in this conversation, dear listener, I am thinking of you and also want to give a big shout out to the Modern Anarchy Patreon family. We have a new member. Thank you, Chloe. I really appreciate you for joining the movement and supporting the long-term sustainability of this podcast. It is your direct donations that fuel and keep this podcast running, and so I am so thankful and excited to continue the fun and juicy conversations on the private Patreon page with you and all the rest of the Modern Anarchy family. I think we will have some more conversations about dominance and what it looks like to explore all of that on there soon. All right, y'all, this is a juicy episode. Buckle up, listen to it twice. I have already listened to it multiple times and continue to gain things from this episode, and I know you will too. I am sending you all so much love, and with that, enjoy today's episode and tune in. Okay, cool. Well, then let's dive into it. If, if you're feeling good with it, I can start asking you questions. And then I know we talked a little bit about like navigating the, the personal um, space of this. And I'm hoping that I could ask you like your journey into becoming a dom, if that is a part of your story that you're willing to share and feel comfortable with. That first, is that we're going to start? And that's where I would like to start. I would love to hear about your journey into becoming a dom, yeah, and where that started and all the steps that I'm sure are a part of that journey. Yeah, so I think that I had a really bizarre entrance into this world, which I actually, I think is the true for everyone. I've been doing interviews of doms who've been in the scene for more than 20 years and every single dom story of how they got in is bizarre and completely different i feel like it's the kind of world where your way in is always a little bit surreal Mm, divine dare i say it it feels divine yeah Yeah. very much so divine so i was working as a labor organizer Mm -hmm. and i was trying to apply to grad school and just was quite burnt out from the experience of being an organizer and didn't have the time to apply to grad school and my then best friend and now wife was an artist and was kind of just giving jobs on Craigslist and found this job listing to beat up men for money. And she was like, well, what if you just quit your job and we do this? And at the time I was in a monogamous long-term relationship with a man. I had never explored kink in my personal life. And I had actually just a few months before that, she and I had both confessed that we had had fantasies that were sort of non-normative for much of our lives I was so terrified of those fantasies as someone who was raised Catholic that I had never looked for porn ever. I had never searched for it. I had never talked about it because I was so afraid of finding myself in that media. So she knew that I kind of had this inclination. Yeah. And she talked me into it because she's really good at talking people into doing things. And it was the sketchiest fucking done. Oh, God. Of course it is. Of course. <laughs> Dungeon is like a really general term. I showed up to an Airbnb on the Upper East Side and it was like this man with this like flat rimmed hat who just was like, all right, you want to do this? Great. Cool. You over 18? Excellent. Uh, pick from this bag, a duffel bag of lingerie and we're going to take your picture. And I was like, what? <laughs> I put on like a superhero mask because I thought that's what you were supposed to. I, I was like, I'm not going to show my face. And my wife actually came up with the name because I had to find a name right there on the spot. And she knew kind of my interest in kind of Greek mythology. And she was like, well, you're a really perceptive person. You're someone Mm -hmm. who's a lot. 
Like, what if you're like one of the Sybils, like someone who sees? And this all happens within the first like 20 minutes of getting to the dungeon. And it's wild to think of how much I've grown into that name since. But yeah, so I all of a sudden I'm Mistress Sybil. I'm in this laundry and I remember this session request comes in. And this woman who was sitting on the couch was in like sweatpants, like eating, like seamless takeout. And I watched her get the request and just transform within a matter of 10 minutes to the most incredibly stunning person I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, she's in these like eight inch pleasers, this like PVC outfit. And I was just beside myself. Ah, my, my sexual awakening will happen soon. Yes, I love this. <laughs> and I watch her go into the room with this man. And I started to hear the sounds of her laughter and the impact. And I, it was like something inside of me just snapped. I was like, I don't know where the fuck I am. I don't know how I ended up here. I don't know what's happening, but this is right. And so everything kind of came out from that. Like mm. I then kind of found out, I, I like sort of, I Googled what BDSM was. I started looking up what kink was. I like wow. held water where I knew what it was. Wow. Thank you. And that was wrong in those early experiences uh, that everyone turned out okay. But yeah, it was this like really, you know, the cart was before the horse and I was trying to catch up to what was happening. But it was like the plan was already in motion. I was only going to be a dom. And it was just that I had to get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Which I can imagine is quite the journey. You said you came from a Catholic background. How do you think that played into all of that? I mean, it's a huge part of it. I, it's a huge part of it. I think that so many people experience this. And, you know, I, I, when I was younger, my, my early, now I understand my early kink memories. I remember like getting off on seeing the bruises on my classmates' knees during Lent because I went to like one of those Catholic schools where you had to pray in front of all of the stations of the cross. And as the oh. Lent went on, you know, you're doing it every single day for an hour. So you would get these bruises. And I remember like, like looking at the bruises as we were going from station to station and then looking at these like amazingly graphic images and like thinking, praying and thinking about the nails and like, yeah, and we would often be like instructed to really meditate on those like experiences of flesh. That was huge in terms of like me experiencing that eroticism. Mm -hmm. And I actually mm -hmm. in college, I had kind of shied away from Catholicism after, you know, as I was kind of growing into myself in my teenage years and then got into college and was really fortunate to be in a religion department mm. where everyone that was there was really interested in kind of feminine poetry and feminine okay. mystical. And I started learning about Catholic mystical practices and was like, oh, there is a Catholic tradition that I am a part of, that I resonate with, that it takes the experiences of spirituality that I've had for my entire life and demonstrates that that's actually a part of what it means to feel safe. And that is mm -hmm. part of what it means to God. Mm -hmm. so I was like reading about Angela of Foligno, like slicing her tits open before I was knew that I was kinky. <laughs> I don't know that story. What is that story? Oh my story? God. And I'm looking to see if I have her book in here. I do. Angela Foligno is this amazing Christian mystic. And she would just have these like, amazing vision like she couldn't go into she was like banned from most churches because if she went she would immediately strip herself of all of her clothes and just jump onto the cross and start like gyrating against it and everyone knew that it meant that she was like divine but people were like we can't have mass <laughs> <laughs> okay. i love this crossover though i love this crossover <laughs> and you know she would like lead from her nipples and know that it was like her stigmata on her chest and was wow. like meditating on visions of like god's you know like the the wound from god as not just like you know on his, on jesus's side but also 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 like a life-giving cunt yeah. like these were like you know this is fucking 1300s i think 1200s wow so i was like reading all this in college like i'm super vanilla this is just homework <laughs> right Oh, right. Yeah. So I think it was a huge part of the Catholic like thread. Totally. And I think that's what I find interesting too, is that when you were in that stage, there was maybe like a lack of awareness of what was going. I mean, that, that's something definitely I felt as someone 
who is queer that went through the church and then would be like using, you know, queer content to masturbate. But I was like, of course I'm straight. Like this is just what I do. Like the just this lack of awareness of what I was doing and where like the implications for that. So I'm curious. Uh, yeah, like you had these desires, but it didn't register for you as kinky at that time in your life. Yeah, I mean, and I think this is something I, as a dom, I feel really grateful for the fact that repression is on the surface. I mean, this is like Freud tells us this. Like, we think that repression is deep down. Repression is always right there. I think at one point he describes repression as like, you know, it's like a code that we just don't have the key for. But other people do. And I think as a dom, a lot of my practice is really paying attention to the things that are just under the surface for someone and knowing that I can play with them. <laughs> and this was part of mine. Like this, this was right under the surface. It was so obvious to everyone that was around me. I mean, a, a very good friend of mine in college, a, a gay male friend gifted me a Wartenberg wheel in my junior year. And he was like, just hold on to this. I think you're going to want this. <laughs> so everyone else felt it, but you. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like now it feels really wonderful to be in the p position where I can feel other people's secrets. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it makes me so curious, too, for like all of the people out there that think they're not kinky that might just not know. Totally. I mean, like this is just it's about language. I mean, these are like if you don't have the framework to understand this, how would you know? And, and you, you hear about this from a lot of people who the shift from of client experiences from the 90s to the aughts and the dawn of the internet. I mean, people who had these vague senses of things that were kind of non-normative about their sexual practices suddenly for the first time ever are like, oh, my God, there are people out there who shared this with me and the, how the internet completely transformed that. So, yeah, I think that having that like ling like language framework changes so much for people and if you don't have that how do you make sense of the ways in which you're just confusingly different right right exactly right and so being able to have the space to see that the content to see that or the people to see that I think that was a lot for me and I even though I do extremely kinky things and play with my partners I still have a hard time watching content in it and I think that's part of like the disconnect from the the intimacy of the person like I found for me I'm able to do so much like dark play with someone that I know and trust out, like in that and when I watch it it feels disconnected and so I don't enjoy it as much which makes me think too like all the people who go to watch that sort of content and then say oh that's not for me that's not for me but it's also like maybe you haven't met a person in your life that you trust enough to go to that space with and have that connection with at least that's my lived experience right and so it's just like I think People need someone who can show them this world. Totally, totally. I think, and this is like a huge part of leather history. I mean, leather history was about, you know, finding someone who could be your guide into a thing, yeah. you know, and, and making those connections and those relationships. And we can, you know, debate about the difficulties now of the fact that you can kind of enter the scene at anyone. But I think... Ultimately, I think you're right that even if you are just entering the scene as someone, eventually you need someone who can help you engage in that dialogue with yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. like, this is a relation between self and other with the self as one of the others. Yeah, say more. So in order to experience yourself as other, you need a third to in play that dance with. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the real values of protons. That's something that we do. You know, I think there's so many parallels between what we do and like the psychoanalyst because we are the other upon which someone can like project their shit and who can then like take those projections and do something with them lead someone to somewhere obviously there's so many ways that this snap could happen in people's personal lives and when it does happen it's amazing but for many people that's just not possible mm -hmm. right 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 and so is that what you feel like you had in that experience when you first stepped into that room and or maybe not? Because did you not have that? Who, who taught you or how did you then, yeah, step into that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't think that I was taught that at that moment. I, and I think it's also like as someone who came into the scene in the way that I did, I don't think that I'm someone who had like a 
a mentor or like a yeah, god. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that I had moments, like small moments throughout the years in which I've been taken in deeper and shown yeah. more by someone. I had an early dynamic with someone who was a submissive for many months. And I would say that our scenes were the first time when I was like, oh, this is a me. Your desire for me, your worship for me is showing me a version of myself that feels right. And it's a wild feeling to feel yourself reflected back via someone else, but know that what they're showing you is you. You know, it's like kind of a, a, a mind fuck. But that was the first time that happened. And, you know, it's happened continually. I mean, I was just thinking actually today about the first time that I played with like a queer uh, masochist. Mm -hmm. And like the first time that I like hit her, really mm -hmm. hit her. I could feel like a shattering at the mm -hmm. and kind of like, oh, there is a death of my desire <laughs> to ruin someone that I it actually like I remember it terrifying me in the moment. And I had an impulse to like really pull back from the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately trusted myself and she trusted me and I trusted her that we were able to kind of go there. But that was, you know, only maybe two years ago. And that is an instance where I was taught more of myself mm -hmm. or someone else. Totally, which I think makes sense within like the psychological realm of theoretical thought that I study. It's always talking about how our sense of self is created in relation with other people, right? Like my identity is created through all the mirrors of relationships that I have. So it makes sense that we would have a mirror who shows us a different part of ourselves that might not be activated maybe when say I'm with my mom, right? Like that's a different space, a different part of myself that is not coming through compared to a relationship where this is being activated and brought out. And so I think part of that then is like, yeah, how do you get access to those mirrors? Where is that space to be able to have that? Because I think about part of the people who are in more like monogamous dynamics and don't have space with you but <laughs> I think about the people who are in those spaces too who like want to explore these things and I want to help people in that space to be able to explore these things and they don't have access then within the restrictions of of their commitments to be able to do that and I think it gets tricky because then I'm like how does some person step into this when this is the mirror that you've had for your whole life and I I, I would say you need a different mirror and I think that part of this that I've been thinking a lot about, I actually, I, I've been reading, I don't know if you've read Avgi Zaketopolu's Sexuality Beyond Consent. It was no, just, I'm going to write it down. It is an amazing book that completely unraveled me. I read it nonstop for five straight days and it was an, an incredible, incredible book. But it really helped me understand for the first time the important, like the specific importance of erotic containers. Mm. I think that's something that really... You know, I think that I was someone who it wasn't a monogamous relationship before I started being a dom and remained in that relationship for several years into starting this work. And I think one of the things that was the most surprising to me was how these sessions that I was having with submissives, we were going places with each other that it's different from just meeting someone on the street. It's different from like having coffee with somebody at a coffee shop, like it's not just the like debasement and the abjectness of the encounter. It was like in this sexually charged place, they were discovering things of themselves and their desires that were completely, oftentimes completely new to them mm. and vice versa. I was having those same experiences and it was really surprising, especially when, you know, like not all clients are, are the people that you're normally attracted to. And it was a, incredible to, you know, be with, in a room with someone that I would not be normally attracted to, who is the same age as my grandfather, um, who has different politics than I do, has different life experiences. And yet we have some kind of erotic exchange yeah. that allows us both to go somewhere with each other. What I've come to understand is like, yes, in your, if you're in a monogamous relationship, you can have friendships, you can have therapy relationships, you can have all different kinds of relationships. But if they are not erotically charged, you are missing some of the core, dark corners of your psyche. That's where shit happens. And if you only have one erotic mirror, I mean, there is so much 
of this part of you, I'm like gesturing to my heart, <laughs> that is not able to speak. And I think that's, if there is an ethical argument against monogamy, I think it's that. Ooh, ooh, I fucking love it. <laughs> I fucking love that as a title. <laughs> oh my God. The ethical <laughs> argument against monogamy. Hey, man, I've sat with that multiple times on this podcast of like as as someone who had stepped into the space of trying to figure out whether polyamory or monogamy was for me and navigating that and even finding these partnerships where I felt like this person met all the boxes and yet they weren't willing to play or go into the spaces that I wanted to do. And like I wanted to be able to access these d different parts of myself that come out through different relationships and that just being an inherent reality of the situation. And so feeling like, yes, parts of my identity would be quite literally cut off by only having one. And I'm always conscious, too, of like not wanting that to ever be an attack on monogamy. But also, I feel like there is really an inherent reality to the fact that you have different parts of yourself activated through different relationships. Sexually or not, right? And I think we understand the non-sexually part of having different friends that have different parts of you that activate different things. But it's like somehow we forgot because of multiple things that sexuality isn't that much different. Or it's very different. It's, it's, I think it's extremely different. Mm. I think it's a place where the more and more can happen, right? Yeah. The more and more ex of experience can happen. It's the place where, like, those forces that try to bind you together are put on the chopping block, mm. like, put up at risk. Mm. And I think there's an obligation to, like, encourage mm -hmm. the people that we love to, like, experience those aspects of themselves. Because what we experience in those erotic domains can translate into lasting changes for ourselves and our identities after the fact. I mean, this is why that's in this text. So I get to pull a lot about slave play mm -hmm. as like a, a reason for thinking about this, you know, thinking about the like antebellum, he like sexual healing or um, I think whatever it's, it's called as like you go to this space to have these erotic experiences that are challenging, that will bring up desires that you want, you didn't ask for. I mean, this is a huge thing about eroticism. We feel desires that we did not choose. We did not check off a box that says, I want to get off by being like dominant. I want to get off by sucking toes. Yeah. The, the erotic desires us. Yeah. And if we don't have any place to reckon with all the messiness of that, then we're holding repressed like hangups around that in our day-to-day -day life. So I, I do think sexuality is different. Yeah. The repressed parts of ourselves and come out and maybe problematic ways, right? Like that repression. Yeah. Say more. I feel like it's coming up for you something with that. I mean, yeah, I feel like I see this, you know, I've been, I've gone on a whole journey with this with clients because I've seen clients who want to play out complicated experiences of misogyny for them. Yeah. And even those who are looking for kind of fem femdom fantasies, they're often really shrouded mm -hmm. in sexualized and racialized fantasies, even if that isn't spoken. Yeah. And I, you know, as the person who was kind of the object of that, the other of that exchange, yeah. experience that person's kind of sexual drive. And for, I think, for a few years when I first started, felt really complicated about it. It was mm -hmm. like, I'm learning that so many men have really fucked up understandings of women and people that are going about in their normal day-to-day -day lives are harboring these things that are quite violent. And I think that's true. But I think that when prodoming is done right or when BDSM is done right, the tops in those experiences can create containers in which we can allow for people to have catharsic, cathartic release from those desires and then come out the other side different. Yeah. And not bring that into their everyday life where yes. it could be silent to a whole different degree. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, within a safe container with all of that, it's a space to be able to, dare I say, move through those emotions, which is a lot of what psychology is teaching me to help people do, right, is to talk and to embrace those feelings and to move through them. And so, you know, I asked the field of psychology, why do we not recognize this as an important way for us to embrace those feelings, those repressed 
shameful, quote unquote, right, parts of ourselves and to be able to have a safe container to play, move through, embody those feelings. Yeah. I mean, especially because, you know, talking is important, but actually like dramatically experiencing them. I mean, totally different. I, yeah, I don't know if like I, I'm really someone that I return to a lot in thinking about this is is Franz Fanon's work on the psychopology. He was a psychoanalyst, an activist from the early kind of 20th century. And while he was in Algeria working with colonized peoples, um, developed this idea of social therapy where for people who couldn't, like if you're a marginalized person, his conclusion is that you can't feel okay in the normal everyday world. It's not going to feel good for you. If you're a trans person, if you're a, you know, a woman, if you're a black person, if you're a disabled person, like, and you are feeling experiencing psychosis or, you know, any kind of mental illness, he's like, what am I, what are you going to integrate into a system that is demanding your negation, like that wants to destroy you? You have nowhere to go. And so his idea was like creating group therapy experiences in which people collectively imagined worlds in which they could exist in which their existence was possible. Oof. And I think of BDSM scenes like that. Yeah. I think of BDSM scenes as opportunities for us to create worlds in which the kinds of identities and experiences of self that are otherwise impossible become possible mm -hmm. for this, even mm -hmm. if it's just temporary, even if it's just fleeting, but it still can provide relief and maybe it can show us the way to something new, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I think that's kind of the ethical dimension of it. Yeah. 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 I'm curious if you could uh, think of an example to give people a sort of story of what that sort of looks like, because I'm vibing with you. But I think a lot of people who have never engaged in this would be like, yeah, what are y'all talking about? Like, what is this transformation <laughs> thing you're saying? Because I've never done this and I don't know. These people are crazy, right? Like, give us some context. Yeah, that is true. A fair point. But I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of I the, the the scene that comes to mind immediately is like I had a scene once with a non-binary person who was like really early into their journey into transness and like trans experience and was like at a place of like really intense dysphoria mm -hmm. around their yeah uh, or around their genitals and their, their sexual organs mm -hmm. and wanted to do a scene that was a ritual in experiencing their body differently yeah so we did the scene where I, because I love genital torture. It's like one of my favorite kinks. Yes. Um, give me any kind of genital and I will fuck them up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so we did the scene where I turned every single nook and cranny of their body into a cock and a pussy. Mm. I like bound their elbow together, for example, and like made the base of their elbow like a cock. And I like bit it and I squeezed it and like scratched it. And then I flipped the elbow around the crease and like ate it out as if it were a pussy. And so went from their head to their toe and helped them discover all of the different places in their body that could become their genitals of any kind that they wanted yeah. and experience the full range of pleasure and pain and sexuality from finding their genitals everywhere um and so in this world that we created their gender was all over their skin <laughs> and you know obviously they're going to go back to a world in which they you know have to like engage with their dysphoria in every day mm -hmm. and it's not like it's going to be cured in an instant but i hope that that experience helped them shift something in their journey to understanding that Right. Yes. A different relationship to their body and the space that they can take up. And so much of this I'm hearing is like the power of play, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like play is like making up a world. Play is making our own rules and the rules are real. In play, the rules are very real. And like how amazing that we get to make up our own world, you know, and a world in which we're like, if we don't like the world that we're in in our everyday, let's make a world in which it's different. Yeah. And like how great that we can do it. And it's not just imaginative and generative, but also super sexy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
that is like the ultimate. Yeah. That is what I'm striving for here. Yes. And I think so many people deserve to have that space to to play in that and to have their sexuality be seen through that lens of, of adult play and imagination and being able to explore different parts of yourselves. I think so many people don't see sexuality through that lens. They see it through a very scripted experience, which I mean, so many people are, the reality is so many people are in pain about their sexuality and feeling like something's wrong with them because they're not enjoying the sex that they're having. And I'm just like, there is so much more, so much more like that experience that you just talked about, right? Like when someone thinks about kink or BDSM or play, like, I don't think anyone would think about that world. And I think part of that is pointing to our lack of creativity when it comes mm -hmm. to sexuality. Totally. And I think this is even true for kink. I mean, I think that when I first started, you know, I was brought up to be like, all right, well, you know, you, you start the scene by like putting the collar on, they kneel on the ground, they kiss your right foot, they kiss your left foot, then you beat them for a little bit, you like give them a little hand job, you like beat them a little more, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And I feel that that is a... Like, God, that's how we're going to think about kids. I mean, the, yeah. like, the beauty of kids, not the tools that we use or the activities that we engage in, though many of them have storied history and traditions, and we should feel like reverence for the ways in which some of the practices that we've had have been passed on through generations. Um, I feel reverence when I see cans of, you know, think of cans of Crisco that have been, you know, looping up people's hands for decades. Right. Um, and you know, the traditions of cane making and vlogger making, but also like kink is like in the imagination. It's like in what you can do with someone's body and the world. And if you're not having fun, then maybe you wasted your money on a vlogger. Mm. Right, right. I yeah. One of my friends just this week got tied up um, completely in war. It was all a surprise planned thing, but um wore like a Miley Cyrus white tank and Calvin Klein like sort of high-waisted underwear and got tied up with a ball to do a wrecking ball scene oh my with some like serious bondage suspension and like was swinging and you know completely tied and suspended and the music was playing in the space and I was just like this is hilarious like there's space to play with these things and have more capacity to have fun with the imagination and what we can do with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, that's so activism. I think that's how I see activism in part of this space is just like helping people to imagine more play that you can embark upon than like the scripts of what we're given. There's so much more space. You have to imagine who else you can be. Like we have stories of who we are, but like who else can you be? You know, like, can you be someone who is submissive? Can you be someone who will push yourself? Can you be someone who can endure something? Can you, do, might you dare to experience your femininity or your masculinity? Like, how can these spaces be places where we risk the experience of trying out different parts of ourselves that might feel like they're not safe or they're not right in our every day and then see what happens? Right. I like know a dom who is like a, a masculine person and experiences like pleasure in feminizing themselves. You can play with it. And because it's play, there's not the same stakes. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. So I ask you, Mr. Sybil, as someone who would like to be a dom, right? As someone who feels very comfortable, easy in the submissive role, but would like to explore the other side. I think I have a hard time, we could call it imposter syndrome, whatever we want to call it, but like I have a hard time being able to embody that identity or to know what that would look like. I think part of that for me is like the social conditioning of the world that I was brought up in, right? As someone who's been socialized as a woman and, you know, particularly within a Christian dynamic, particularly someone who was watching The Notebook, Titanic, and Taylor Swift and being like, I know, <laughs> and being like, I'm going to be saved by this prince and, you know, in a castle. 
which like I love the romance don't get me wrong but also I think that that has resulted in a concept of self where like I don't see myself as a powerful dom that would come in and control that sort of energy and it's something I want to explore but also feel like how does someone do that how does someone start to do that I think the first thing that I will say is you can be waiting for a prince and be dominant. The trick that it took me a long time to learn, I think it takes everyone a long time to learn, is not that you need to that you need to embody sort of the message of feminine dominance or dominance mm -hmm. at all that we get from yeah. the stream that we see on the internet. It is about finding what feels dominant for you mm -hmm. and what dominant lo dominance looks like for you. I mean, there is incredible power in making someone go through quests and, you know, battle dragons and run around the kingdom while you're sitting pretty in your fucking castle. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? You're on top in that scenario. Hey, hey. <laughs> not the prince who's sludging through mud in the moat battling alligators. He's the simp in that situation, mm -hmm. that's what I'm concerned. And so I think it's figuring out what are the narratives and ideals and stories that feel exciting for you, and then asking how dominance is working in those scenarios. Mm -hmm. It's not about picking up a flogger and tell or telling your partner, barking orders at your partner. It's really doing that internal int introspection. And I would also say, this is like, my might, might sound silly as advice, but I think it's helpful. That when you start exploring dominance with a partner, going as slow as you possibly can. I think that especially if you're new, you feel afraid that you have to razzle and dazzle and you have to make them feel overwhelmed and you have to show them that you're in charge and you have to do all these things right at once. I mean, in my first sessions, I would go through my whole list of things that I was going to do and then I would look at the clock and 10 minutes had passed mm -hmm. and I would still have 15 minutes on the clock and I would be like what on earth am I going to do with this man 50 more minutes oh my god <laughs> and that taught me the value in slowing down mm -hmm. because when you slow down you actually give yourself permission to ask yourself this question that is forbidden for so much of us which mm -hmm. is what do I want in this moment? Yeah. What do I actually want to happen? Yeah. Now that my partner is kneeling or is sitting on the bed, their eyes are blindfolded, they're waiting, what do I feel like doing? And I think once we dare to ask ourselves that question, a dominant voice will start to emerge. And it might take time and it might feel scary and it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel uncomfortable. But I think you're finding your dominance is learning to listen to that voice mm. and trust it. So, yeah, the practical advice is to really slow down and see what happens, see what impulses get generated in you. Right. And learning to trust yourself to follow them. Totally, totally, totally. And that's beautiful. And I love that idea. And the other half of me really struggles with it because I think that, like, first stepping into more like uh kinky play relationships people would ask like yeah what do you like and I always was like I don't know you know like I have no idea people would ask me and just without having experience in this like I couldn't even fantasize or think or just like have any sort of grounding outside of the script of like pv this that you know mm -hmm. what I mean and so like when you're saying this I'm like thinking to myself like okay what what do I want you know like I'd love to be worshipped or to have people like and so like maybe it does start to come out in some ways that is different than what you're saying. But like, I still feel like I'm just grasping for that voice and and struggling to hear where it's at or what it is, because I just feel like there's no, no example. No. Ugh. I mean, I think that like, I'll say two things on this. One, I think that impulse of wanting to be worshipped is a place to start. Totally. Totally. It's extremely dominant to be yeah. like. I, what I want from you and what I want you to do is worship me in this specific way and make me feel this way. Right. Giving yourself the space to actually ask that of someone, recognize that you want that and feel what it feels like to get it, is you 
building the muscle of your dominance. Mm. And I think also something that um, this is not my idea. This is Mistress Trinity's idea. She's mm. someone like she's a collaborator of mine. And she once told me that she differentiates between not just tops and bottom, but active and passive as two mm. energies you can have. So you can be an active top. For instance, I am a fan of hurling people into walls. Mm hmm. I greatly enjoy. I would I would say that I'm more of an active top. I don't love being worshipped a ton. And active bottoms are service bottoms, people who want to, you know, do work for you, do worship for you, versus a passive bottom who wants to be strapped up to the bed and just be taken on a journey. Mm -hmm. You can also be in a passive top. Yeah. You know, my wife, Mistress Cleo, is passive top par excellence. Yeah, it's tell me. Her <laughs> session. And she just like lounges on the bed. <laughs> gorgeous cat and just like demands someone do exactly what she wants them to do and the way that she holds space like only three things will happen in like 45 minutes but it's so riveting that it feels like everything is happening huh? and feel how much her bottoms are obsessed with her <laughs> as well they should be right you know, and she can throw her whip two or three times, but knowing exactly when to do it and doing it only when she wants and only giving as much as she wants and not giving any more because she's a fucking princess. That's dominance. And so I think letting go of the myth that dominance has to be active. Totally. Is a good first step and journey. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'll say one more thing on this. Who we are as we're discovering our dominant voice, it's a work in progress. Cool. Maybe, right at, maybe at the beginning, it's like all that I can think that I want to do is be worshipped. Great. But then maybe as it happens more and more, you're like, well, it might be kind of fun if I worship you while I was like pinching your nipples. Sure. It might be fun to kind of hook my hand into your jaw and guide you to places in my body. So really? You will start to kind of evolve and shift and you will have different eras of your dominance and follow that trajectory. So, you know, if at first it doesn't feel like it's quite right, but it's something, follow that thread because something is better than nothing and it's leading you somewhere. Totally, totally. That face play is very, very fun and very like charged as something to do, you know, something that you don't get to do with most people, like just in our normal day to day of like grabbing someone's face and having that power with that right and i think like even the idea of being worshipped brings through these other concepts of like the quote-unquote selfishness of just receiving right like i think this is where it gets tricky of like all the psychological layers that come out with that voice of like yeah i'd love to be worshipped and have people at my feet right and then my other the other conditioning goes well that's selfish nicole what are you giving back to them and it's like that is what i'm giving back to them right like and being able to like challenge those voices i'm just i'm curious how many people out in the world might have these thoughts like me and then have all the other conditioning that is just coming in the way that is getting in the way of hearing their inner dom voice yeah a I lot mean, i think this is the trick this is the thing if you have that impulse the daring but exciting and i promise rewarding thing is what if I dare myself to have a safe, consensual, negotiated experience in which I'm selfish? What happens if I dare to let myself go there? Yeah. This was actually a huge part of my, it, it was not quite selfishness that was my drama, but I am someone who is, you know, an organizer. I'm, a, mm. I'm very community minded. Yeah. I am strong anarchist politics. And my entire life, I also wanted everyone to just do what the fuck I tell them to do and that's the that line <laughs> yes for my entire life it was like there was these two wolves inside of me right there was this community minded person who believed in collaboration and this drive to be in control and exp and I would always suppress that part of me because I thought that it was wrong and against my politics and in these scenes was the first time that I dared to feel what it would be like to be someone who just was in fucking control. Woo! Like, fuck communism. Fuck anarchy. We are in a fascist state right now. <laughs> and you know what I say? <laughs> and honestly, it was terrifying, but also extremely hot. Yeah. And it's much easier to collaborate in my everyday life because I have a container for those feelings now. 
they don't grip me anymore. And so if you allowed yourself to be like, just like indulgently selfish with someone, how would it make your the rest of your life different? How would it mm-hmm. open up space for you to not be afraid of being selfish? Because you have a place where you can get that out safely yeah. and in a hot fucking way. Right. Right. And I think the crucial part of that is that you mentioned at first it felt terrifying. <laughs> can you speak to that? Because I think a lot of people get to that point, look at the mountain and say, I'm not climbing that because I'm scared. Yeah, I think I was like, the feeling is like, what will this mean for me? Oh, yeah. What does it mean if I am a do- if I literally am ordering people, these like naked men on their knees and like demanding that they do things that I'm getting off on it? What yeah. happens if I leave a scene and I'm wet? This, what does it make me? And I think that that's a really real fear. It makes sense. We are told that we can only be one person. This is like a myth that we've been taught. I held that fear. I moved past it in my case because I was on some fucking mission to figure out what was on the other side. And when I did, I found that it didn't change who I was. Mm. It allowed me to come to peace with parts of myself. Mm -hmm. I think that if you feel that fear, it's like a good clue that there's something on the other side of it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And dare I say that divine intervention of like knowing that within yourself, that there was something more that was just waiting to sprout. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us feel that. I think if you're someone who's like interested in kink, it's probably because you feel there's something in you that is destined to sprout that hasn't sprouted yet. And if you feel afraid or if you feel nervous or if it like gives you a tingly feeling, I think that that is not a sign to shy away from it. That's a sign that like it's like something is happening here. This is the path. Like keep going down that road because there's more to unpack and discover. Right. And like the difference between anxiety and excitement can be really, really small, truly, right? Like we're getting that activation in our body. We're feeling that energy and being able to decipher the two, I think can get really tricky because they get kind of close to one another. And also the uncomfortable nature of growth, like that just is a part of the equation, right? And so there are many things we do in life that are uncomfortable leaps that we take and we grow through and so i think getting comfortable with that is part of the process of your own evolution wherever that takes you i mean also kink is about transgression Mm. like we have internalized very deeply that there is a certain normal order of the world that we are supposed to fall into and there are like internal policing mechanisms that are there to stop us from trying to challenge that order I mean, I have a lot of clients who are like, why aren't there more female doms? And I'm like, they're out there. They just haven't figured out how to move past those internal policing systems. They haven't figured out how to risk yet pushing past that message of what femininity is supposed to be, what womanhood is supposed to be, and dare to experience something else because of all of that indoctrination. So it's feeling that like anxiety It's because you're getting somewhere close to where you're going to start challenging systems of meaning, systems of power that you're not supposed to be challenging. Yes. Yes. I'm like, bring me some Foucault. Like, I'm up here in it. Let's go, you know? And I'm always trying to tell people, like, you want to see the patriarchy? Like, look to your sex lives. There is no further place you need to look than to right there. And it is a bed for all of this because I think you know, as someone who's a woman, like the amount of times that, you know, I'm taught to say sorry for my existence, let alone to step into what we were talking about earlier of like, this is my fascist state and I'm going to claim this space. Like, what? Like, you know, like I'm apologizing for just taking up space, let alone to actually take that up and control that. Like, there is a lot of psychological control from the system that is deep, deep, deep in you know, the barriers to get to that. And so like you're saying, when you start to break those down, you start asking questions and really good questions, dare I say. (laughs) I also want to say just to like, you know, make sure that I'm hitting both sides of this. Like, it's just as risky to be like, I'm going to be a woman in charge as to say, I want to be objectified as a full-on bimbo. 
Like that is also risky because we're not really supposed to desire that. We're supposed to just be at discomforting peace with it. And so like femme bottoms or mask bottoms who like want to kind of indulge in the pleasure of patriarchy, the pleasure of objectification, just as risky, just as scary, and just as transformative. Ugh, I've loved it. <laughs> like just talk about taking off the cognitive brain and just being a piece of meat. Like it it, <laughs> it feels so hot. Yeah, exactly. You know, it feels like the first time that I like played with a bimbo, I was like, this feels wrong. It feels mm. wrong to really objectify a woman. Yeah. But also then, thank God we have spaces where we can feel these things that are wrong. And thank God that she can experience this in this hot negotiated container, as opposed to some fucking rando Tinder date who's not going to appreciate the risks that she's taking, the surrender that she's going to, and the awareness that she has nearly as much as I will. Absolutely. And all of that creates a crucially different container than experiencing objectification on the street through random catcalling. That does not feel good. I do not like that, right? I'm putting that into a container where someone honors the intensity of that sort of experience and what you're giving through being submissive in that creates a radically different container that leads to a radically different transformation. 100%. It's all about the container. Yes, always, always. And it's so funny. Like, I remember recording with Empress Wu, like, early on, like, two years ago at the very beginning of this, like, podcasting journey and just being, like, so enamored with them and just being, like, this is amazing. And then following them on Instagram, be like, I want to be this. And it has been such a light, I would say, like, you know, an angel in my life of some sorts of being, like, there's someone who does this and I could be like this. I could be like this. I want to be able to be like that, right? And like, it's just so crucial to see those, like you were saying, these callings in ourselves that are, are gentle and light at that time and being able to start to explore and play with them and have the space to like live that out and the transformation that can come through that. And I think that we live in a really exciting time where like, you know, leather has changed so much and it constantly changes. But I think we live in a really exciting time where people like Wu, people like Mistress of Debt, people like Cleo, people like Lucy Sweetkill, people, you know, these doms who are thinking, Dia Dynasty, who are thinking about kink in this like radically kind of transformative, ritualistic, yeah. native, artistic way. Yeah. Yin Q, obviously. These are people who are really opening up, I think, kink to a whole different genre um, of experience and doing it in ways that are like blatantly queer, even though it's also within the kind of commercial BDSM space, which I think is super exciting. Yeah, I think bringing in like a different aesthetic, you know, the classic femdom aesthetic is amazing, but I think they're opening up kink experiences to a different kind of aesthetic that is making it something that people who didn't identify with the like red black dungeon mean leather you know vibe can now identify as something that they can see themselves in mm -hmm. which yeah i feel really excited that i can be part of that generation and meeting with and playing with a lot of those people yes absolutely because that's activism that's providing a example of how to show up in the world that we don't see otherwise and like you said it creates an ability for someone like me other sort of people to look and be like i could do that i can mm -hmm. definitely do that like i like that and until we see that person embodying that sharing that with the world we just don't even know that that's possible yeah you just gave me so many good recommendations for the podcast i'm like y'all where are you at i need to talk to every one of you and we're gonna work on this together uh yeah, they're all amazing. And I feel really like, I think one more note that I'll make about on that kind of group of people is that I feel like something that's really different about prodoms today is that we invest a lot of time in turning these energies onto each other and ourselves. A lot of the people that I've mentioned are people that I've played with personally and who I know have asked for scenes from each other and other doms. You know, we, I think, take really seriously a commitment to you know, some of the things that I've talked about and that we've been talking about around 
kind of the political aspects of kink, the transformational aspects, the capacity for it to unshatter, the power of play and imagination. And it's something that we create for ourselves. And like, I'll tell you that having a bunch of doms creating a container for each other, nothing feels like it. That is magic. Yeah. That is power. And yeah, I think it's a really, I think it feeds all of us and it ends up really informing all, all of our practices. That makes sense because we grow in relationships, right? Yeah. So then you bring all of that energy together and you grow together and the co-creation of that sort of space sounds so empowering. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Man, absolutely and man if i could gift that sort of experience to everyone that's my goal like how do we get everyone to feel that level of embodiment in whatever capacity that is for each person and their own identity but man i want people to feel that level of sexual embodiment and power the next stimulus package from biden should just be like one session with the dominatrix <laughs> for every <laughs> I think that that would change the game I really do I really do think being able to like sit and be with someone who knows how to embody that space it will bring out those parts of you that you didn't even know existed that you didn't even know existed speaking from personal experience right <laughs> yeah I want to hold a little bit of space as we come towards the end of our time do you feel like there was anything that maybe we didn't talk about that you really wanted to hit on today. Otherwise, I have a closing question that I can bring our experience to. Mm -hmm. No, I think we covered a lot of, we covered a lot. Good. Yeah. Good, good. Well, then the closing question I ask everyone on the podcast is what is one thing that you wish other people knew was more normal? Was more normal? Oh, my God. Yeah. Easy question. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm conflicted about this question because on the one hand, I'm like, so many kinks are normal and people don't think so. I mean, every single client that I have comes in and is like, I bet you've never heard this before, but I actually have a foot fetish and I don't you do, do that kind of thing. And I'm like, brother, every man on this fucking planet has yes. a foot fetish. But I also want to just advocate for the value in thinking that something is not normal because if we... On, once we understand that something is normal, I think it loses a little bit of its erotic uh, titillation. So I actually think it's great when people don't realize how normal something is in terms of their erotic desires, because it allows them to like indulge in the thrill of it mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a really sad world if kink was totally normalized, mm -hmm. if like it was just as basic as going to this, you know, buying a donut and having a cup of mm -hmm. coffee. So... I don't know if that's anything that I wish people knew was more normal. Yeah. I think we should protect the uh, marginality and transgression mm. of kink. Mm. Yeah. I feel like if I had like a box for like what it means to be an anarchist and the amount of people who I've given this question to and be like, well, I don't agree with normality. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you're checking the boxes. There's many guests who have come in and been like, no, Nicole. And I'm like, that's right. That's the right answer. for <laughs> Um, but totally. Yeah. So, so like normalizing the non-normal nature uh, of the eroticism. Right. Maybe if anything, normalizing the, the, the experience that of something foreign and yeah. scary being inside. Yeah. Maybe that. Yeah. Maybe it being something that we all, we all know that we all have weird bizarre unspeakable erotic fixations and fantasies and desires and just because we have them doesn't mean we're a horrible person yeah what those are i think should remain perverse weird and not normal yes 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 i love that and then being able to play with that in a consensual container how transformative and transgressive and as as uh it was so lovely to chat with you and get to learn from your lived experience. And it was just such a pleasure to bounce off ideas with you. Likewise, it was really fun. Yeah. Where would you want to plug so that people can connect with you, find your stuff and yeah, connect deeper with you? So I, you can find me as at Sybil Fury on Instagram and at Sybil underscore Fury on Twitter. And then my website is www.sybilfury.com. 
Ooh, I'll have all of that linked below. So amazing. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. If you enjoyed today's episode, then leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast and head on over to modernanarchypodcast.com to get resources and learn more about all the things we talked about on today's episode. I want to thank you for tuning in and I will see you all next week.